Hi, my name is Patricia King, and I have with me Mickey Robinson, who has the, the most amazing testimony of God's healing and actually resurrection power, I would say, because he brought you from, brought you into life. And Mickey, you were in a car or a, a airplane crash mm -hmm. many years ago, mm -hmm. where you just about lost your life. Can you just kind of recap? Um, that experience for us? Well, I was uh, a skydiver going up to make a practice jump with uh, four other skydivers and a pilot, and um, uh, it was we lost our engine shortly after takeoff, and so there was a horrible impact, and I was soaked with fuel, and uh, had substantial injuries. I had a brain injury, I was blind in my right eye, massive burns, and after that injury and the sicknesses that followed, I had internal injuries where I had internal bleeding, where I was bleeding 10 pints of blood a day, and my esophagus was damaged and I didn't eat any food for a year and had all these things that were really incurable. And I was a person that you know, had never met a Christian, didn't know anything about healing. Uh, but right from the beginning, after I was, filled with, you know, was saved and filled with the Spirit, even though I didn't know what those terms, never heard those terms before, um, you know, the word salvation is salvation of the spirit, soul, and right. body. And God healed me of all of those things. And, uh, for example, I was blind in my right eye for five and a half years. I was blind as a bat. And uh, when my sight was restored, the doctors had actually done an operation. And during the operation, uh, actually uh, three months after my accident, I told the nurse, hey, I think I could start to see. And in 15 minutes, I was in surgery because uh, the tissue was thinning out. My eye was going to burst. And so they put a cadaver's uh, exterior on my eye and made two eyelids from skin behind my ear and sewed it closed to protect the eye from just losing the whole eye. And they said, well, maybe we'll try and fix it. But they determined the eye was too bad and that mm -hmm. it would be like wasting an opportunity to do a, trans uh, a corneal mm -hmm. transplant. Well, I, I was going for plastic surgery so often I kept seeing the eye doctor and bugging him and said, yeah, I, I'd be able to see. And, and this is five and a half years later. By then, I was Barbara and I were together. We had our house and they called me and they did this operation. And during the operation, they took off the old cornea and through the giant microscope they saw that the eye was dead. It was, mm -hmm. it, the iris was wrinkled and adhered and there was no reaction to light and they could see in the retina. And I just told Barbara, I said, I want the room blackened. And for seven days I fasted and laid down, didn't move a muscle and they took the bandage off and I could see. Whoa. I said, I said oh my God. And he says, what do you mean? Oh my God. I said, I can see. He said, you can't. And he said, but I looked like Marty Feldman when I was going this way, when it was this way. <laughs> and there was two of everything and I didn't know, is that the road or is that the road? So I didn't, you didn't want me to drive. Wow. It took about two weeks to pull the image together. But I just determined, I just, something in me just knew I wanted to, I could see. You were see. determined to see. Yeah. It was determined you were like it. blind Bartimaeus. He wouldn't <laughs> let anyone tell him. Yeah. Otherwise, he was going to go see Jesus and get his sight. And both legs, I had bilateral nerve damage. I, I, all the muscles, and all the everything, the nerves were dead all the way from here to the ends of my toes. My feet just hung down. Well, this leg started to gradually get healed. Well, this leg never did, and I had a leg brace on it. And I was having surgery twice a week. And I was going to therapy, and therapy to me was cool because that's how I was going to get out and go skydiving again when I would get out of therapy and it was, was ridiculous. Nobody thought I ever, I was in a wheelchair, you know, but I just, for some reason I knew everything was going to happen and I would speak to my legs. Now I had never been to a healing meeting or did anything and I would say legs move and this leg would, would move and this leg was a, like, this was like the compliant James Dobson leg. This was like <laughs> the strong willed teenage <laughs> rebellious. It's very frustrating when you speak to your body and it doesn't respond. Right. And then one day it complete restoration. Now, I, uh, a you professor. Mean just a whole instantaneous. Instantaneous. Now, in, in a moment of time. And, and it was. I, there was a professor of the, of the, uh, of the medical yeah. college uh, in the University of Iowa who said he would not hesitate to call that a miracle, a miracle mm -hmm. because you'd never get return after that length of time. It'd be very wow. slight, very gradual. I just took the leg brace off, threw it away, and, and the doctors were flabbergasted. They didn't know what to think. And mm -hmm. I had everything wrong with me, so I'd been in, I was living in a rehab center. It's a rehab hospital, mm -hmm. 400 basket cases, beds, you know, and uh, and they had this string coming out of my nose because they were dilating my, I couldn't eat anything, and they were stretching twice a week, stretching out my esophagus so I could get liquefied food down. And so the doctor took me to every clinic in there, and he said, we did a new operation, he watched this, and everybody knew me because I was easy to recognize, believe it or not. And uh, I'm in my one-hand wheelchair, you know, most of the time, but now I'm, going, I'm walking, and he said, watch, we did a new thing today, and he'd pull the string, and I'd kick my leg. You know, <laughs> they have to take credit for something. Yeah. Yeah, no, that actually really did happen. And uh, but you know, I, I had so many. Uh, one of the most amazing wow. miracles that uh, 
because it transcends normally a person would think of. This hand was up. This hand was pretty useless, and it, it looked like this. Because when you get, if you ever seen somebody like a burned body, they mm -hmm. where there's no flesh, they they, they kind of tighten up. Um, and so they basically, this is you know maybe like a year and a half later or so, they basically excised or took all of the tissue off, and it was just raw flesh with veins sticking out. And they cut a little pouch here on my side and slipped this in, took a skin graft off my behind and laid it down and put my hand in over there and sewed it together like this and let this grow, grow on here really? for six weeks. So I have, I have the longest theatrical run, uh, continuous imitation of Napoleon, of anybody <laughs> in modern stage and theater. And then they cut it out and it looked like a little boxing glove like this. And they did all these different operations, many different operations. Yeah. They had to go down between bones and get it to work because basically all the fingers were amputated and, uh, wow. to create that. And so they did all of that, very complicated. It had a big wire going through it, like a UHF antenna. I could get all kinds of channels. And, <laughs> and uh, then after three days, you know, the main doctor had to go to a way to do a seminar. And so the second string guy came in to change the bandage. And when he did, I just heard him say, oh, no. Now, you really don't want to hear that, you know, very much. And he took off the bandage, and it smelled like a dead animal and the whole thing was black and hard. All the tissue was dead, and it was hard. And he says, oh, we lost the operation. So that means the whole thing was a waste, this whole huge, giant operation. And so he says, I'll have to come back tomorrow. We'll have to just cut everything off and start over, you know, you know do something else. And so I just, I don't know what to think. I mean, it didn't that register could be fear. a traumatic moment for anybody. Well, I asked the nurse for seven pillows. Mm -hmm. And I stacked them up, and I put this bandaged hand on that pillow, and I stared at my hand all night, and I commanded blood to go into my hand. Now, I never read about healing, but you remember the scripture says Jesus looked intently at this person. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times we pray for people, and we just go, oh, Lord, heal them, you know. And I, you don't, it's not a matter of force, but in this situation, and I have a scientific background. I have, was good at science, and I, especially biology and anatomy and all that. I didn't think for a minute that the arteries going in there are filled with coagulated cement mm -hmm. uh, blood, you know, that's mm -hmm. like cement in there. Right. I didn't think for a minute the difficulty would be for blood to get in there. Mm -hmm. All I did was command blood to go in there. The next day the guy comes in there with a little cart with all his stabbers and cutters. And, 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 and especially if your arm's raised up like that, it's like the blood has to go uphill then, right? Well, I just <laughs> put it, I was sitting up in the bed and I put a light on so I could watch and I stayed up all night and I spoke to my hand wow. and I commanded blood to go up in there. So the guy comes in, the doctor comes in, he lays the thing out, and he under, goes. He has all the instruments that he's going to do to cut off all this dead tissue. I mean, it's, it's, it smelled like a roadkill. It smelled like a dead animal. And um, he took the bandage off, and it was like brand new little baby butt skin. And I had Amazing. no, there was nothing up here to tell me how to do that. But in the years since, you know, I pray for people, I don't even, you know, sometimes there's a healing presence and it's just there's an atmosphere for healing, mm -hmm. as it was in Luke 5 mm -hmm. when uh, Jesus was teaching, he was really teaching the kingdom to Pharisees and lawyers. People had come as far away as even from Jerusalem, and he was in Galilee. And, um, and then he, he senses the power of healing was presence, and then he's you know, plaster falling in his lap. Right. Because four friends of a paralyzed man yeah. would not be hindered by the right. crowds that wouldn't let him in. They pressed in. And Jesus looked up. See, Jesus got interrupted by the Holy Spirit because they brought somebody. They, they were determined mm -hmm. to have their friend healed. Right. So sometimes there's just a healing presence that comes. Mm -hmm. But I think and sometimes God will give you a word of knowledge. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I'll be ministering, to, praying for somebody or ministering to them prophetically, mm -hmm. and they'll have not told me anything, and God will just show me something, and healing will come. Uh, yeah, and, and, and sometimes God will have you do something that it seems strange, like, I'm sure that when the Holy Spirit told Jesus to spit, you know, spit on eyes and stuff like that, you know, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make maybe sense to the natural mind, but you do it because he's telling you to do it. Well, and then the results came in. God told you what to do, and you did it, even though it doesn't make yeah. sense to the mind at the time. Yeah. But your obedience was an act of faith. Yeah. Mickey, why don't you pray for people that need healing right now? Because I, I know that you carry a miracle anointing, mm -hmm. and... There's people watching right now that need a miracle of healing. Yeah, I see in somebody there's a chronic throat infection or swelling in the lymph glands right now, and uh, and you've been on uh, antibiotics one after another, and it just seems to either recur or it never goes away. And there's a fear associated with this. 
I just take authority on that, and I just speak the healing love of Jesus, the warmth of, of Jesus, like warm honey going down your throat right now, and just wiping all that infection away. Uh, someone else also has uh, an acute stomach uh, gastrointestinal disorder, like acid reflux, and you've had it for years. I'm just that instantly, it's broken, and the correct balance of the release of, of chemicals needs to come in there. It's also caused an upset uh, uh, because you're not digesting properly. You got a weight issue, uh, and you're frustrated with that, and you even have shame. And God's going to—he's going to—he's going to stop this gastro, and he's going to give you the, without uh, some kind of suffering or technique, he's going to give you a chemical balance and a metabolism to, to eat normally and lose this weight. But most importantly, he's going to set you free from right now, from worry and anxiety that's associating this with this gastro thing. And but it's very horrible and it's very painful and it's very disturbing. Um, someone has uh, really bad pain in your feet and you just can't stop because you have to do certain duties and perform and all that. But you have, you wake up with almost a dread of life. This is robbing you of your joy of life right now. So I just speak right now to uh, this osteo condition in your bones and uh, the fallen arches right now. I just speak that those four pieces of tissue that raise, uh, that make up the arches would just raise up right now. And the bones would separate and the inflammation would go down and you'd be instantly set free and you would have an anticipation of good things in life and not a dread of suffering pain. Because you're supposed to walk in love, walk in peace and walk in joy. And actually, <clears throat> beautiful are your feet that bring good news. You start testifying about what God's doing for you. You start proclaiming what God's doing and you're going to see that you're going to become a fountain of life. Um, awesome. Barrenness. Sorrow has been upon you. You've prayed. You've asked. You've had people give you prophecies. I'll tell you right now, start singing over your barrenness. Start thanking God. Start thanking God. Start singing. If you're all alone in your house, put on a CD and sing along with it and start singing and prophesying over your own life that you are going to bear the fruit of a child. These kind of children that come are usually very special. They're very pure and very anointed, and you will love this child because you've cared so much about it. I just break right now that barrenness right now, and I pray you can have the desire of your heart. God's even going to give you perception to see and feel, and you're going to take away the anxiousness about even thinking about uh, a normal marital act. You're going to just be in love, you're going to get pregnant, and you're going to have more than one baby. Not at a time, but just <laughs> the barrenness is over. Amen. That's awesome. Mickey, thanks so much for just for being you. What a gift you are. And I praise God for, for saving you, for rescuing you, for healing you, and for raising you up to be the wonderful man of God that you are. God bless you. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then they can't see me. This is real. I mean, I, I'm not here because I had chlorine in my gene pools and I was healthy. It's all about God's mercy and his love and his power to heal, restore, and to give life.